Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Let us move on to our next chapter on beams. You know, we have already seen this uh, animation, we will, we have seen it in the context of trusses. Now, we will refocus our attention on the beams. First striking feature what you get is the cross sectional dimensions are much smaller than the length of the member and they are also called as rafters and you should notice that they are supported only at the joints, supported at the ends. They are the simplest beams that you can analyze and what is the kind of load that this experiences essentially transverse loading. You have the beams used in a roof truss, they are also used in a bridge truss. I have what are known as floor beams, they are again supported only at the ends. They are very simple to analyze, there are also beams that are supported in between, we will see a classification of them a little while later. Here again the loading is transfers to the member. What you have to notice is a beam supports transverse load. The cross sectional dimensions are much smaller compared to the length. And you have uh, various classifications of the beams. Right now, you should be able to uh, identify what is the support that I have shown on this. You can identify that this is a fixed support and I have a slender member like this, I have an end load and this has a particular name, this is called a cantilever. You have many examples of cantilever that you come across in your surroundings. One simple example is your sunshade. Many of the sunshades in the building are essentially cantilever. And look at the branch of a tree. Branch of a tree is again a cantilever and there is also something very interesting in the case of a branch. How does the cross section of the branch varies along its length? Very intelligent. God has understood engineering mechanics much better than you and I learned. You have that tapered so that where you need higher cross section to withstand the bending moment, you have a higher cross section. It is not like a constant cross section that I have shown here. So, nature is very, very intelligent. And you call this beam as simply supported. You should be able to identify what is the kind of uh, end support I have used. Please note that this is only a symbolism. You should know how to interpret the symbols. What is the striking difference between this support and the support shown here? The difference is in the rollers. There are many ways books represent these supports. So, I have tried to show different forms of them so that you can interpret the symbolism whenever you come across a problem from any book. 
such a beam is very simple to analyze and you also call that as simply supported beam. And I have a slight difference between the beam shown here and the beam shown below. What is done here is the support on the right is moves inside and you have the beam protruding out of this support. Have you come across any such practical example in your life, in your surroundings? Because I have always been emphasizing that you are trying to analyze systems around you. That is the purpose of this course. How many of you are swim swimmers? No, we are all very studious people. We never go near sports. That is very, very unfortunate. And, uh, you know, if you have gone to a swimming pool, if you find a person is uh, stepping onto the springboard to die, the support may not be this far away, this may be closer to this. So, you have a practical example where divers, when they jump into a swimming pool, you have a overhung beam, either a overhung beam or it could be a cantilever depending on the construction that they have made in that place. And this is called a overhung beam. So, there are different names given to these beams based on the way supports are located and how the supports are made. I have a fixed support here, I have a hinged support here or a pinned connection, I have a roller support here, I have in this beam, I have a pinned connection here, I have roller support shown in the rest of the beam. And you have to give a name to that. What is the kind of name the people have coined? I have many supports and people call this as a continuous beam. See, for every type of beam we come across, you can always find a practical structure around you. Only then you learn engineering. Can you identify a practical structure which everybody has to use that convenience when you go home. When you travel by a train, please also note the rails, how the rails are supported. And you have this uh, support at periodic intervals. You have not three, you have thousands of supports. And not only that, people also go and qualify those supports as uh, beam on elastic foundation. So, people can go very close to reality when you go for higher level courses. In this level of the course, we say everything is rigid. We say the supports are uh, again uh, rigid in the sense they do not sink. Whereas, in a practical rails, the floor is not rigid, you also accommodate the elastic behavior of the soil beneath you. I have another example here. What is the difference between a cantilever and what I see here? The end is not free, but the end is supported. Can you tell me a practical example that you normally come across? you have a big bungalow and you have a big portico, many of the big porticos they will have a support at the end. And I have another uh, type of uh, beam, I have shown this as a fixed support, I also have another fixed support, you call this as a fixed beam. See, I have the luxury of putting the beam as a nice rectangular piece. You can simply write it as a line. If you can closely look at the way I have listed the beams, 
do you think that you can learn something more from the way they are classified from whatever you have learnt earlier? See, in this course, we assume everything is rigid and I use equilibrium equations and this is a planar situation. I can have only three equations written. So, I can determine only three unknowns. So, one of the basic exercise that you will do for all problems is whether the problem is solvable from equations of statics and you call it by the name statically determinate. I have given you the clue. Can you apply your mind and find out how the beams are listed in this, how they can be classified? What do you have in this segment and what do you have in this segment? Even if you take one example on the left, one example on the right, you can find out the classification. When I have a, let us take a simply supported beam, how many unknowns I have here? I have two and I have one. I can write three equations, I can solve for all of them. On the other hand, when I go here, how many unknowns I have? I will not be able to solve it from equations of statics. I have to bring in the deformation behavior so that I can write one more equation. I need as many number of unknowns, I should have as many number of equations. So, the way the beams are listed here, this set can be classified as statically determinate and this side can be classified as statically indeterminate. And I have shown a variety of uh, members here and you have to tell me which of these are beams. In the previous slide, we saw everything as horizontal members. I have a horizontal member like this, but I have a vertical member here. Can you call this as a beam? Yeah, 50 percent of you say you can call it as a beam and 50 percent of you say you cannot call it as a beam. Because we have seen in the previous slide, all beams were horizontal. But I asked you to notice one important fact when we looked at the roof truss and a bridge truss which also had rafters and floor beams, the loading was transfers to the beam. See in English if you go say what is a beam, I can consider that as a light beam or I can also say somebody with a beaming smile, the word has multiple meanings. So, in the context of engineering mechanics, a member that supports transverse load is called a beam. The member can be vertical like this, but still the load is applied transverse to this. The member could be inclined like this, but the load is transverse to this. One of the common confusions students have is whenever they look at a member which is horizontal, they do not think, they jump on to an immediate conclusion that it is a beam. I have clearly shown that this is supporting only an axial load. You do not call that from engineering mechanics point of view as a beam. And you know recently Kerala is in spate and all dams are overflowing, they are sending out water. Can you extend your knowledge of whatever you have discussed as a beam? to what you see in a dam. I can see the dam cross section like this and I would have a water column applying a force here and this you know very well the pressure the increases as you go down. You have a basically a triangular loading acting on the dam. So, this is one practical example where you have a distributed loading acting and I said when I do a analysis of any civil engineering construction, the self weight is so important cannot be ignored. How do I model that? 
That is what is shown here. I have a beam, I have a uniformly distributed load. This is nothing but accommodating the weight of the beam as a load acting on the beam. See the books in order to train you to handle distributed load gives different types of distributed loading to get a mathematical practice. But if you look at from a practical standpoint, you will come across either uniformly distributed in many cases representing self weight of the beam or you will have a loading which is triangular indicating the load that could come from a liquid column. So, you should be comfortable in handling uniformly distributed load and triangular loading. You cannot escape out of it. They are very, very common and you should be comfortable in handling this. And you have many other examples. You have a crane, this is acting like a beam and you should also be surprised to learn that there are springs which are used in automobiles. If you see a huge truck, if you look at the rear wheel, it is supported on a structure like this. See, normally you have seen a spring which is coiled like this. That is a normal string that you come across. This also behaves like a spring, but you have to analyze the members subjected to bending. They are called leaf springs, they are practical examples. Then we move on to some fun facts. Okay, we have seen that uh, Romans were good in building aqueducts, and uh, we recently visited this place. It is called a Mathur hanging trough. This is the longest trough bridge in Asia at the height of 115 feet. And I have this uh, side view of the bridge. You could see very tall columns supporting the bridge. In essentially an aqueduct, see this is taken at a time when there are no floods in Kerala. So, there is no water in the bridge that you had seen. But that gives you an idea where you are at about 115 feet from the floor and this is a beam of 115 feet long. And there is also another interesting uh, bridge. This bridge is made of uh, roots. Roots of trees around 500 years old are grown for the purpose of making a bridge in Chirapunji, Meghalaya which is known for the heaviest rainfall in India. And the locals were very clever. They had made this and you can understand from solid mechanics point of view, engineering mechanics point of view, whenever I have a transverse loading, that structure behaves like a beam. And what is the tree is, it is actually an Indian rubber tree, Ficus elastica grow secondary roots to climb boulders in this mountainous region. This property was exploited by the locals to make bridges to cross streams which receive heavy rainfall. It is a local answer to a human need. And mind you, these bridges stay for 200 years, whereas man-made bridges lifespan is 75 to 100 years. But the difference is here only humans can walk, that is how the bridge is constructed. And I was also very surprised, they had multi-layer uh, bridges. So this is the bridge in uh, Umshiang and it is a double decker root bridge. So when there is heavy flow of water, they will use the top uh, bridge and the other one in the bottom bridge. And there is also another very interesting bridge here. This is at Dwaraka. This is the, the Dwaraka, this temple. You have this Gomati river. This is a suspension bridge. What is interesting is, it is very similar to the routes that you have seen. You have array of cables. They are needed to support this hanging bridge. We read beams separately. We have seen the roof as well as the bridge a combination of truss and 
floor beams. And here you have a combination of a beam and cables. And we will also see a combination of trusses, floor beams and cables. All of these are needed to support transverse loading. See, this bridge is a short bridge, maybe about uh, 500 meters on Gomati River, supported by strings as well as your bridge, you have the pyre. And one of the very famous bridge which uh, people would like to go and see when they want to tour the world, this is a Golden Gate Bridge at San Francisco. And what is interesting to note here is this is a very long bridge of 3 kilometers, close to 3 kilometers. And from a distance, can you perceive this as a slender member? This also gives you some ideas about idealizations. If I want to find out the natural frequency of this uh, bridge, I could consider this as a slender beam and get first level. My results will be far away from the final result, but may be acceptable as a starting figure for you to aid your thinking. Suppose I take a closer picture of it, I do see that what I see as a slender member is actually a truss. I have this truss which we have seen and this is suspended by cables. And one of the records show they have used 1,30,000 kilometers of wire to support this bridge, mind-boggling number, fine. And it is a massive structure, you will feel it only when you travel on this. So, you have the feeling of traveling on the bridge, you can see these cables supporting this, there is a massive pier which is supporting this suspension. And what I want you to notice is, when we see here the board, the board would say there is a maximum speed limit of 45 miles per hour. See, the idea here is, when you design bridges, you will also have to load them carefully. See, after the bridge was uh, established in the 1960s, they had a 50th year celebration and they had invited uh, people around to come and visit the bridge. Without their anticipation, about a lack of people landed on the bridge. Bridge was not designed for that, it is a suspension bridge. So, it developed some structural problem at the mid span of the bridge. So, they have now decided for the 75th year, they are not going to invite public. Because loading is very important, fine. And this is on the Pacific Ocean, that is separating the San Francisco Bay and this. And they have designed the bridge to withstand wind speeds of 160 kilometers per hour. See, the scientific community learned a lesson from Tacoma Narrows Bridge that collapsed because of wind forces. And it appears it can accommodate a swing of about 8 meters. Imagine if there is going to be a swing like this, you should not get onto the bridge and then walk. See, now Kerala is in spade, all the bridges where you have, they all have overflowing water beneath, one tendency for human beings to go and watch. And it is having a heavy current of water beneath and imagine thousands of people stand on the bridge, you will also have to go with the water. So, do not try out all of these uh, stunts. And I would also like to show you another interesting application where the technology is going, you all feel that glass is brittle and this is a 70 foot cantilever bridge at Grand Canyon. See, scientific development is so good that we have mastered how to make bridges out of <coughs> glass. They are very strong. You can temper them and you use uh, uh, some kind of uh, coating and fibers and so on and so forth, you have this and what you will have to look at is you see the canyon beneath you very clearly and they have also said that uh, it has a good friction so that you can easily walk, you can also see people walking on top of it. 
of course this is not meant for the your uh, car to travel on this human beings can walk over it to that extent you know this is uh, achieved and you find that glass is used glass is also attractive because it is a green material if glass is broken i can melt it use it for some other purpose so that's how all civil engineering constructions are now heading towards to you go to any mall you will find railings are replaced by glass unless you understand glass from mechanics point of view you cannot employ them there let us now get on to our understanding of a slender member you know i have shown a small portion of the member imagine that this member is very long the cross sectional dimensions are much smaller compared to its length and i have also taken a member which has a plane of symmetry i have also shown the axis i have the x axis along the axis of the member y and z axis suppose i pass an imaginary plane through this slender member what are the forces that a slender member can transmit we have to understand that and there is also a symbolism that is used in higher level studies they use the symbolism like this i could have a force acting on the surface of the member this is denoted by two subscripts first subscript denotes the plane on which it is acting so you can very well see that this surface is actually the x plane plane is indicated by the outward normal and the force is in the direction of y so that is why it is put as fxy this is the notation that you will come across in your second level of course but in this course this is simply represented as capital v with a subscript y indicating in the y direction there are multiple symbols used in textbooks my interest is to expose you to the symbolism you have to know that for you to interpret when you come across i would like you to make a neat sketch and put these forces i could also have a moment like this when i have a moment like this the member can bend in this plane i have a slender member this moment will bend it see only in this course you make a distinction between what is the moment that causes bending of the member what is the moment that causes twisting i think in your earlier learning you have always associated moment as a twisting moment you are never uh, even bothered about whether a moment can produce bending if i have the moment acting on the axis the member will twist so i could have a moment like this this is denoted as m x z so z is the direction this is the positive direction that i have here this will cause bending in x y plane i have this member i have bending in this plane or bending in this plane okay when i apply the bending moment anti clockwise it will bend like this when i apply the bending moment clockwise it will bend like this i could also have a bending moment denoted as m x y so when i have this member it was initially bending in this plane now i can also bend like this or like this in the horizontal plane then finally i can also have a force in the x direction and a twisting moment the moment m x axis 
is also a moment has the same units as Newton meters because it does the action of twisting the member you qualify that as a twisting moment. You also call this as a torque. I think in your uh, study of uh, physics you have worried about torque and you have always associated moment to your torque, you have never associated a moment to bending like this or bending like this. In higher studies you will have two subscripts, one the first sus subscript denotes the plane and the second subscript denotes the direction. So, a slender member in fact can support three forces it can transmit three forces as well as three moments. If I have to design a slender member, I need to know what are the forces acting on it. And I would like to find out the critical location so that I can design the cross section appropriately. So, I essentially need to know the variation of these forces not at one section, how does it vary along the length of the member. That is what you get from diagrams like axial force diagram. We have seen F x x is acting along the axis of the member. You may want to see how does it change from section to section along the length of the beam. You call that as axial force diagram. I could also have a diagram which indicates the variation of shear force. It could be F x y or F x z, either of the two. Then I would also be interested in knowing the variation of the bending moment along the length of the member. I call such a diagram as bending moment diagram. And I may also be interested how does the twisting moment varies from cross section to cross section. So, the idea of this chapter is to learn how to plot of the four two of the diagrams shear force diagram and bending moment diagram. And in this what is important I have a beam like this. Suppose the beam is subjected to a bending moment like this, you could see I am applying a clockwise bending moment, fine. And how do you find what happens to the top fiber? This is obviously not rigid, it is a very flexible member. I am not a superman, but still I can show the deflection so easily here. With small forces, this is bending like this. Can you see something happening to the top fiber physically and something happening to the bottom fiber physically? What happens to the top fiber? It is stretched and the bottom fiber is compressed. This is what I had shown in your uh, earlier discussion when we were comparing a truss and a beam. In the case of a beam, the forces, the stresses developed vary in a triangular fashion. One half of it experiences tension, another half of it experiences compression. I have shown the bending moment like this clockwise. Suppose I have the bending moment anticlockwise, reverse of this would happen. So, from your design point of view, more than the sign of the bending moment, you are worried about the magnitude of the bending moment. That is very, very important. The magnitude is very important for your design purpose. That is what you are really looking at. Nevertheless, when I want to draw the diagram along the length of the beam, I should have both the magnitude and direction of the beam bending moment properly denoted. That requires a systematic training. We will see the nitty gritty details now. Let me take a simple beam. I have a beam supported on a pin joint and a roller support. 
and you are also given the dimensions, you could replace this bar as a simple line for your the notes. And one of the first uh, steps in analyzing this problem is to determine the reactions. It is also given the distances A and B are such A plus B equal to the total length L of the beam. Let us write the free body diagram of the simply supported beam. You should put the coordinate axis and replace the supports by the forces which we have already learnt. How do I replace a pin joint? I do not know the direction of the resistance. So, I denote this by a horizontal component and a vertical component. See earlier we have put this as a reaction and put it as R A X, R A Y and so on. It will be too cumbersome to write like this. I have labeled this as A. So, you can also simply write it as A suffix x and A suffix y. And how do I replace the support at B? It is a roller support. So, I have only one reaction or B y. So, I can use the equations of statics. When I say sigma f x equal to 0, that gives me A x equal to 0. I say sigma f y equal to 0, that gives me A y plus B y equal to P. And I can take moment about any point, I take it about point A. When I take it about point A, I have the force P and I have the reaction B y. And what is the way force P? gives the bending moment, it is clockwise. I would like you to visualize that. It gives the clockwise bending moment and the reaction B y gives the anti-clockwise bending moment when I look from point A. So, I get this as minus P A plus B y into L equal to 0. I get this reaction at B as P into A by L it is not Newton meter, it is Newtons. Okay. You correct this. And I have A y equal to P B by L Newtons. In fact, once you are experienced, you should be able to determine this reaction just by inspection. When you are learning it in the initial stages, you will read sigma f x equal to 0, sigma f y equal to 0, sigma m equal to 0. After solving 10 problems, you should be able to write them by inspection because they are very, very simple. Okay. I have to find out what is the bending moment. So, I take an arbitrary section, throw the beam between 0 and A. I have taken the origin here. So between 0 and A, I will take a section. So, that will tell me what happens in this section. If I take another cut between A and A plus B, I would be able to find out what is the general variation in this section. Now, let me make a imaginary cut at a distance x from the point A. I call this as section 1 and section 2 and I draw the free body diagram. When I say the free body diagram, I should put what force the slender member is transmitting. We have already seen in general it can transmit three forces and three moments. Here the problem is simple. So, it will be essentially transmitting a shear force and a bending moment. And in your earlier discussion, we have said this is a unknown, I have the reference axis like this, I could represent the unknowns as positive quantities to start with. I can put the shear force V like this and we have followed a convention 
anti clockwise moment is positive and clockwise moment is negative i do not know what is the magnitude of this what are the directions to start with i put this as in the positive direction my mathematics will tell me whether the assumption is right or wrong when i analyze the free body let us just follow the principle fine so when i do this i get sigma fi equal to 0 i get v equal to minus pb by l i determine the moment that gives me m equal to pb x by l is there any difficulty at this stage there is no difficulty at all now let me solve the problem not by taking the section 1 let me solve the problem by taking section 2 i have the section 2 i can start afresh when i start afresh if i don't know the direction assume it in the positive direction and then proceed with it so let me put the shear force acting in the vertical direction like this and your bending moment is anti clockwise let me solve this free body diagram let me put fi equal to 0 I get V equal to P B by L. I have M equal to 0. I get this as finally when I do the simplification, I get this as minus P B X divided by L. Individual free body diagrams are systematically analyzed absolutely no problem have we missed anything in a free body diagram if you don't know anything you assume it in any direction your mathematics will give me the final direction okay you will not say that whenever I solve a problem, I solve from left to right. We would solve a problem by taking a section out of the two sections which is simpler to solve, we will take it and then determine the unknowns. Ultimately, I want to find out what happens at section xx, that is my interest. If my interest is only that, it is simpler to handle the section 1 and get the answers. Section 2 is not good for finding out for this section at a distant x. On the other hand, if I have to find out what is the variation in this segment of the beam, I can make a cut here, then this one will be simpler to analyze than what you have it here. So, I want to set a stage we may have to solve a given problem starting from left to right or right to left which one is simpler in handling mathematics. We had one convention if you do not know the unknown forces put them as positive and then find out the values is not sufficient. Do you see the need for developing a sign convention? If you look at the answers that you have got in this and the answers that you have got earlier, I have got the answer for this. When I summarize, I get this as V equal to minus P B by L, M equal to P B X by L. When I analyze the segment 2, I get V as P B by L, M as minus P B X by L. 
when I finally go and translate this on this, when I change them, both the results will give me the same answer. But the question is, when I want to plot a bending moment diagram or a shear force diagram, how will I write this as positive or negative? Individually, what I have solved in this free body diagram is correct. Individually, what I have solved this free body diagram is correct. But collectively, we have missed a very important point. You know, I would like to spend sufficient time on the sign convention. The idea is each book follows a different sign convention. See, after learning beams under me, you should be able to solve problem from any book and verify your answer is correct or not with his sign convention. Because people rush through sign convention, you should not rush through sign convention, you should get your fundamentals clear. I want you to go back and ponder today, what are the ways that we could rationalize our steps. So, in this class, we have looked at uh, what is a beam, what are the different classifications of the beams. We have looked at cantilever, simply supported, overhang, continuous beam, propped cantilever and also a fixed fixed beam. And we have also classified them as statically determinate and statically indeterminate. Then we looked at several examples of what is a beam in things around you. And I said of the distributed loading, you should be comfortable in handling uniformly distributed load and triangular loading because these type of loadings you come across in many of the practical applications. You cannot miss them. Then we have also looked at beam is essentially a slender member and a slender member can transmit in general three forces and three moments. And in this chapter, we are confining our attention to the slender member behaving like a beam. So, we take a simpler the beam for analysis. The loads are in the same plane as the beam is drawn. You essentially have only a shear force and a bending moment. And we have looked at the difficulty in associating the sign for a given bending moment or shear force when we solve the problem from left to right or right to left. You need to have a sign convention. We have not done any mistake individually. But collectively, when I want to solve a complicated problem with several loadings, I may have multiple sections. I should have a convention for me to analyze from left to right or from right to left so that I could identify a strategy how to solve the problem in the easiest manner possible with less mathematical computation, yet I get a result that can be interpreted without any doubt. Thank you.